Lars, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much for finding time for this interview. You are well known for uh, for digital, for social media, and for the content itself. But I want to refer to one of your interviews, which you, um, where you said that brands need to understand that uh, this is not purely a media platform where you only need to invest all your dollars. You need to invest yourself in creating and managing a relationship. And uh, you said it in regards to um, influencer collaborations, because you said it is uh, hyped and overpriced sometimes. So could you please explain a little bit more the message which you wanted to deliver? Yes, I think to just look at it from a helicopter perspective, why, is, why are influencers important? It goes back to the fact that you want to have a relationship with them. You believe that they are authentic. You believe that, that they know something that you don't. And you put your, your trust in those influencers. And that's why they are important because they have that authenticity and they also have the reach to, to a certain amount of, of people um, where they have that kind of influence with, with that authenticity. If you, as a brand, just perceive them as a media channel, then you will buy your way into having them promote your product. And it will come across as a very transactional relationship that you have with that brand and that brand has with that influencer. And that shines, that clearly shines through when you see the content at the end. Like when you see those pictures of influencers holding a bottle of, of a special night cream and they suddenly say that this is the most amazing night cream ever and two weeks later it's a different uh, night cream that they are promoting. Then that comes across of course as very inauthentic. So it's a long term game for all brands and that requires more investment than just money, it requires that you build a relationship with those influencers. It's not enough, like only a few brands can afford to buy like Kendall Jenner uh, for a certain amount of, 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 of posts, but most other brands, they need to build a relationship to make sure that that influencer is both impacting the product, is, is, is going into helping them with developing a product that is relevant for that audience and believes in that product for the audience, but also, um, a brand that understands what issues and challenges the influencer might have and then they can help. So in my, re in my point of view, I think it's more important that you enter a relationship that is, that is more like a collaboration and not just a transactional relationship because that ends up sometimes, or actually more often than not, it ends up damaging the authenticity of that creator influencer and that actually has the trade-off that the audience will disappear or at least there will be a decline in, in, in the audience. So I think it's very, very important for brands to consider this as a long-term game and also invest in in-house resources who understands how influencers work instead of just throwing the money at a media agency who then go and buy an, an influencer. So do you mean that uh, brands should uh, grow their own influencers or they just need to understand how to work with them in a proper way in long-term projection? I think that depends very much on the challenges for the brand or the the way that the brand wants to go to market if if it's like a short-term thing then 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 yes you can buy your way into getting instant awareness but if you want to have that long-term relationship then you need to have those in-house resources who will have that dialogue with the influencer and who can understand how the influencer marketing world works and uh, you created one of the most uh, influencing um let's say presence of a toy company online. Um, so um, how did you do that? What was your secret? I think there's a lot of reasons why we were able to progress as fast as we did. I think first and foremost, it was because we were actually allowed to build in-house competencies. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a, a strategy already before I came into the company that they brought me in to build those resources in-house. They wanted to have that competency and those capabilities inside the company. And I think that's very, very important because social media is the way that you now communicate with your audience. It's not just uh, how you speak to your audience and how you message your, your audience. It's more importantly how you listen to your audience. And if you, if you place your listening capabilities outside the company, 
like the most intimate contact you have with your consumers are through social media. If you place that capability and that opportunity it is to listen to your consumer, if you place that with an agency or with a, a moderation company, then you basically take your ears off your company and put them somewhere else. So I think, why would anyone do that? So that's why you really need to focus on, on building those capabilities in-house. I think that was one reason. I think, secondly, we focused on not building, not, not being good at one thing, uh, not being good at building Facebook applications or not being good at doing Twitter. I constantly told my team and I s tell everyone who cares to listen, the most important capability that you can build in this world of today, which is disrupting every single day, it is the ability to change. So I try to build a muscle of change in the company um, and really focus on how to be as the, best, the best company in the world at adapting, predicting, and, and creating change within that industry that we are part of. And I think that's a, that's a big difference from saying that we want to be good at Facebook or we want to be good at Twitter, because we all know Facebook is declining so much in, 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 in how publishers can use Facebook. It depends on small changes in the algorithm, how it can be successful or not. So instead of being good at Facebook, we became really good at, at, at change. In relation to that, so every company has uh, marketing budgets allocated for social media, for digital developments, and so on. Um, where do you think, in, in modern world, where this budget should go to? I think it's more important than where it should go. It's more important to, again, look at how fast you can allocate budget and execute on a budget. I think that that's the most important part because sometimes you can, if you spend a small budget at the, at the minute it's, it's most critical, that tends to be way more efficient than if you should spend a bigger budget uh, not timed correctly. So I think what also created, where we created a lot of success was actually we're using quite small budgets, but be very, very efficient and empowering the teams so all of the people sitting in the front line, they were able to both develop content uh, assign budget costs, production costs, but also to assign media budgets instantly. And, and you have to have that agility and also empowerment in your organization if you want to move at the pace of the consumers, because consumers are changing constantly. So I think it's more important that the size of the budget is actually the way to allocate the budget and, and to make sure that you push the budget uh, to the right, whatever channel that might be at the right time. How do you see, um, I mean, which platforms you can highlight as the best platforms to work with um, in any digital strategy of a modern company? I think it, that depends on the company, on the product, whether it's B2C or it's B2B. Um, that, that really depends on, on the challenge that the company and what consumers they want to, they want to reach. You can see that there's a big shift right now where Facebook, of course, is, is, is losing traction. Instagram has a high traction. You see TikTok and ByteDance coming out of nowhere, like they were started in late yeah. 2016, and suddenly they have 500 million monthly active users. So that is changing so fast. So it really depends on each company to decide where they want to, to invest their resources and then be very quickly at switching those resources and building that in another channel. And I would also say it, it's often very, very cost efficient to be in a lot of the channels very early, to get be, become part of that hockey stick when, when suddenly things take off. Uh, that small investment in the beginning that can really take off where, as Lego had to do, uh, they, they came in very late in the game, like 2011, not even on Facebook or YouTube. On, like, that took a lot of, of energy and a lot of hard work to actually turn that around and make sure that we, that we, we became successful at, at Lego. So, so I would say it, it's very much about like getting in early and then making sure that you invest in the right channels depending on your, ch on your challenges as a company. Yeah, do you think it is, um, it is a big risk for a company to try to be on all social media platforms because it requires a lot of dedication in terms of creating the content and the col collaborations which you need to probably have with uh, influencers who are um, you know, performing good on each of those platforms. I'm not going to say that one platform is better than the other because it all depends on where your consumers are. If it's a B2B business and 
then, might, then you might just want to do LinkedIn. That might be LinkedIn that's a big platform. Mm -hmm. If you're a B2C company, it's a big B2C company and your consumers are on all of the platforms, well, you might need to be on all of the platforms. So that really depends, again, I, I, I typically try to say like, well, you need as a company to be where your consumers are. If, if your consumers are not on the platform, no reason to be there. Like, why be there if, if, if no one is around that c you can actually impact with your, your relationship that you try to build with your consumers? So you need to go where the consumers are, and you also need to be very tough in those decisions. Sometimes you might have a tons of subscribers on what platforms, but if your consumers are not those subscribers, then there's no reason for you to be there. And you need to be tough enough to take that trade-off and say, like, no, we will not be there anymore. So, so that, 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 that is more, you need to go where the consumers are, and that is not just on social media, that's of course like any kind of marketing. If you're still using a TV advertisement and, and you're trying to target uh, people around like 16, 18, then it might be more useful to, to go on Twitter or Instagram. How would you describe innovation in social media or in digital in general nowadays? To me, it's important to distinguish between innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. Creativity is part of innovation, but not all creativity ends up with being innovative. Okay. Innovation to me is the moment you take a new creation, something new, or you combine two things in a new way, and then you scale it to create business impact. And I think the last bit, you need to scale and you need to create business impact. That is, that is the most essential part of innovation. Innovation is not just coming up with a new idea. There's a ton of new ideas and a ton of new ways you can do things, but unless you actually scale it to impact a business, a huge amount of people, then it's not innovation. So I think it's important to always focus whether, th whether that's digital, whether that's outside digital, that innovation is about the tough part of innovation. It's not coming up with the idea. The tough part is to scale it and then to create value, whether that's monetization of the innovation or mm -hmm. value, brand value in some other ways. Like nowadays we speak about um, artificial intelligence and that um, computers will be able to replace human beings in some processes. Um, do you think it would ever be possible to replace, you know, this creative mind which e every human being has uh, with the computers? Yes. Because, like, forever, that's a long time, yeah. and innovation is going to take a long time. I think, I think what is going to be very important when it comes to AI is is really about making sure that lawmakers, politicians, like everyone who is setting principles, policies and guidelines around AI are aware enough and are equipped to actually make decisions on how to set those policies. Mm -hmm. Because AI is, is a very, very powerful thing that can be used in a number of different ways. And, and we need to make sure that we are able to, to control that from the beginning. The same way as we see now with, with GDPR and digitalization and data privacy are becoming, a pump, has in the last five years become really t hot topics. I think that that is, that is AI in one, two, three years. So I think on the creative part, like the creative minds are, are of, of, of human beings are extraordinary. And I think we will have a lot of, seeing a lot of, of, of um, supercharged AI devices that can help creativity. Um, I think we are pretty far away from having the human brain substituted by an AI mm -hmm. when it comes to the whole thing. But, but I think it, it's, instead of seeing it that it can replace the, the creativity part of it, I think it will take on a lot of the, the more ordinary tasks. So we will be able to dedicate more time for, for the creative part of it. So I think th that is more how I, how I perceive it. And, and I see the bigger challenges is actually making sure that we equip those lawmakers with enough knowledge about AI to actually make the, the right policies and decisions uh, about it. As we all know, China is uh, taking a big part today in um, all digital and IT developments, right? Um, how would you see, um, what is your personal projection on China? I think it's going to be hugely impactful. And I'm not going to say I told you so, but, but I've, I've, like if a few years ago I said like you need to look 
and the Chinese social media networks. You need to look at them. And out of nowhere, we saw TikTok. Yeah. Like we saw ByteDance coming. We saw them acquiring um, Musical.ly. Uh, we saw them with Tochao in, in China, also a hugely successful news app. Um, and, and of course, we see the whole WeChat uh, integration and super ad app strategy in, in China, which is, uh, which is very, very impressing, I- impressive. I, I think I've, I've been to China many, many, many times, and I'm impressed about the speed there is in the development and adoption of a lot of the, 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 the technical developments, whether they're plat- mm-hmm. platform or platforms or, or other. They have a market that is the biggest market in the world, 1.3 billion people. That means they can scale extremely fast to a huge number of people before they actually go outside China. As I just said before about TikTok, it's the first time we have one social media network that is actually a global network. Facebook, YouTube, any other network is not global. And with, with mm. TikTok, it suddenly has become a global platform where you can reach everybody in the world. I think right now the valuation of TikTok is around $75 billion. It's around five times as much as Snapchat. So, so you see that coming out just in two years' time, which is, which is hugely, hugely exciting and, and also a bit scary because that's another disruption that's going to happen uh, very, very soon. So I think, I think it's so important that, that we are really aware of what's happening in China. I think it's, it has shifted from previously we saw Chinese copying San Francisco and Silicon Valley. A lot of things now it's become more even and you see a lot of I'm sure Facebook is looking at a lot at, at WeChat to see how they can actually create the same integration with commerce to make sure they have the same in- integration because then you become like the, 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 the front page of any customer's or consumer's life if you make those connections into into all of those things. I think where it's two different models where Facebook is monetizing only or mostly through advertising. Then you see WeChat has chosen, a, a, I, th- I would say, a bit more long-term approach where they try to protect the social product and then they monetize through the ecosystem mm. and take a small c- uh, cut here and there f- through WePay or through o- all of the other services that are connected. So it becomes a more holistic and integrated part where you see the, the challenges that Facebook has now faced in the last many years with privacy and also with people turning away from the product because of, of the push of, of, of advertising. So I think it's hugely important to, to look at China. I think it's hugely important to be in China, to understand the Chinese consumer. Um, and you need to go to China. You need to go to Shanghai. You need to stay there for a while. You need to talk to the people. You see how, how closely it's integrated uh, into, into the culture of, of any consumer's life. What do you see is going to be the next thing after internet and social media? I have no idea. <laughs> if I knew, if I knew, I, w- I would, I would be very, very rich. If I knew exactly what idea, but of course, as you mentioned, like the combination between AI, cloud services, facial recognition, all of those things, like we will see a lot of products uh, coming up, Internet of Things, uh, all of those things will will definitely uh, impact us very, very, very soon. I think also around audio is going to be a huge thing when we see. When we start to having, like, I think the AirPods are just one of the first things where people will have always in-ear yeah. uh, devices. The moment where you see, you, see, you actually see it right now, you might look like a douche when you're wearing those, but it suddenly becomes more and more acceptable. Yeah. And at, I think at some point, I think you'll, you'll definitely see in-ear devices before you'll see people wearing Google glasses or all of that stuff. I think that, that failed miserably. But I think in-ear devices is something that, that might become a bit more acceptable when they get to a smaller size. So I think those things and the combination of those things are something that's going to be disrupting the entire world very, very soon. But then I think it's also important to see that some of the things around environment like sustainability, it's something that we need to be focusing on more and more and more. And I think you'll see a lot of businesses focusing on it. And when it comes to social media, I think mental health and social media is already a big trend. And I think that's something that's going to be developing even more, where people will be hopefully getting a more balanced approach to how mental health can, imp- how social media can impact your s- uh, social, your, your, how social media can impact your mental health, both in a good and in a bad way. So I think all of those things is are very exciting, very frightening, um, but but it's it's really important to be part of it 
And as a company, you can't just shut the doors and hope for the best. You need to be out there. You need to make sure that you also are trying to create the future that will be the best for your company and your consumers and, and for the world as a, as a whole. Uh, in one of the interviews, I believe you mentioned also that uh, you don't, uh, you, you try not to own the things. So you're not buying many things. And uh, how do you see society will change in 10, 20 years or what impact it will have on economy in general? Apparently, I've, I've been trendy very for a very long time because I've never liked owning things. But I travel a lot and even when I'm not traveling, I, I tend not to, I think things, they tie me down. And I think owning a lot of things is, is, is taking away freedom. That's how I feel it. I think when you buy a product, you also buy a problem. Because if you buy a very expensive thing, then you need to have very expensive insurance, you need to take care of that, like you need to move it when you move, and so on, so on, so on. So I feel more free when I can rent things. And I think with the emergence of, of things like Airbnb and Uber, it's like that whole economy, uh, creating marketplaces where you can easily approach things, buy things, borrow things, uh, rent things, it's become much easier and much, much more acceptable that whenever you need something, you can just rent it or you can buy it for a short time. I think also the focus on sustainability. We don't all need a car. Like It's actually better for the environment, better for society if, if we don't have one or two cars. Sometimes you just might do use one for a weekend. So even though I really like to drive, I don't, ha I don't own a car. Um, but I do like to rent that special car for that special purpose when I need it. So I think that's, that's going to be impacting consumers and companies a lot more. And I think those companies that can create those models where they become a platform or a marketplace, mm -hmm. um, they will have a very bright future. And those companies that do not see that approach coming or do, do not go for a niche where, where there are consumers that still want a product, um, they will have a, a, a tough challenge in the future. If you if you can dedicate your life for one, you know, to solving one single problem, which problem you would like to you would like to solve? I would like to to clean up the planet. I think that that would be that would be a, a big step, and yeah. So to make sure that we would have sustainable energy across the world, I think that's that's the most critical issue that everyone should be focusing on right now. Mm -hmm.